Hello everybody, this is the first video in a series outlining a combat guide for Fallout and Fallout 2, a post-nuclear role-playing game. This video covers character builds, and I'm going to try and make it as thorough as I can, but if you see anything I missed or think should be included, please let me know in the comments. I said I just made my own music cause I didn't want to get dinged for copyright. So to start this guide off, most of the people playing this game today are using purely digital versions you get from Steam or GOG. Both great places to get your games from, but I bet you haven't seen this handy dandy Fallout 2 lab journal, courtesy of your friends at vault -Tec. 161 pages of instructions and documentation, some of which is no longer current, two blank pages for notes and an advertisement for Baldur's Gate. In addition, there is some extra artwork, a little bit here and a little bit there. Some of it's kind of cool and some of it's kind of weird. And there's that advertisement for Baldur's Gate. I mean, the manual is another perfect example because I didn't know what I wanted it to look like. I just said, I want this to look like some sort of manual that the vault people made. And then Kurt Decker came in very soon after that. He's like, I found this in the trash. It was a field manual from like the Navy and it looks exactly like the Fallout 1 manual did. Now, if you're one of the lucky many who doesn't have a manual, you don't have to fret too much because a manual is included with your install. Open your Steam app, go to your library, right click Fallout or Fallout 2 and just go down to view player manual. This opens a PDF version of the manual in the Steam browser with, you know, so-so scans sometimes, but the manuals for Fallout 1 and 2 are both available, at least on Steam. I'm sure they're available on GOG as well, I'm just not sure how to access them. If anybody wants to provide instructions or a link to a video, please do so in the comments. Now, there are several different versions of this game, so this next part applies only if you've installed the high resolution patch or downloaded the Steam or GOG versions which have the high resolution patch already included in them. And this applies to both Fallout 1 and 2. The first thing you want to do before you even load a game or start a new character is go to Options, Screen Settings, and this screen is divided into two sections, Resolution Settings on the left and a few Game Settings on the right. First off, let's take a look at the Resolution Settings. This works the way you would expect, and you should set it to match the native resolution of your monitor. But you'll notice this list is a little small, and that's because I have 2x scaling turned on. With 2x scaling off, the entire list shows up, but here's what the game looks like with 2x scaling off at 1920x1080. And here's what it looks like when you turn it on. For best results, I recommend using the x2 scaling. Makes loot easier to find and reduces eye strain from staring at the tiny little pixels on the screen. And if none of these resolutions work for you, try windowed mode and just pick a lower resolution and see how that looks. Next, go ahead and set your colors up to 32-bit. I haven't run into any compatibility issues on Windows 7. Okay, let's take a look at the game settings. Just ignore Fog of War, leave this unchecked, don't even worry about it. This only applies to Fog of War, just ignore it too. Make sure ignore PC scroll limit is turned on and change your pathfinding range from normal to max. In the original game, the viewable distance was actually locked to the player character. The limited view was actually shorter than the maximum range of some of the sniper weapons, so this will actually help combat too, because now that you've unlocked the screen, you can see the entire map. Next, make sure all your panel scaling settings are set to fit. This will match the menus and movies to your resolution while keeping the same aspect ratio. And finally, just click inside the box to change the sidebar art for your Pip-Boy. And then click done and we're good. This walkthrough is mostly about combat, but I'd be remiss not to include a section on character building and how it affects combat. So let's make a new character and take a look at the special and what the different attributes actually do and how they help or hinder combat. A huge difference between Fallout 1 and 2 and later Fallouts is that your special doesn't change that much throughout the game. There are a few quests that will add an occasional stat point here and there, and Fallout 2 has them gain special perks which Fallout 1 does not. But for the most part, what you put in your special is what you're going to be using throughout most of the game. Now having said that, don't worry too much because they balance the game really well. So you can play with a whole bunch of different types of builds, but all it means is that you'll want to plan ahead just a little bit and focus on adding to that build throughout the game. To help with that, let's take a look at the special, starting with Strength. Your strength affects five things on your character sheet. Your hit points, your carry weight, your melee damage, and your unarmed and melee weapon skills. To start with, we'll ignore skills for the moment. You get skill points each time you level up, and you can raise them as you play. Now, strength only affects your starting hit points, and you only get one hit point per point of strength. And since by the end of either game, you should have around 100 hit points or more, that's not really a good trade. On the other hand, you do get 25 points of carry weight for every point of strength you put in, which can be helpful early game, especially if you're like me and you like to hoard everything. But you do get companions fairly quickly in both games, and in Fallout 2 you get a car, which is just a giant storage unit you end up hauling around with you. Man, I wish they would bring that back in later Fallouts. And finally, it does increase your melee damage, but only by up to 4 points, and even then it doesn't change your base damage. 
This can be helpful early game and somewhat useful mid game if you're playing a strictly melee character, but power armor, when you get it, depending on the type, gives you a plus 3 or 4 bonus to your strength, and you'll find ranged weapons easily outclass melee weapons in damage. Now, that doesn't mean you can't punch the emboss in the groin until he falls to his knees, it just takes a little more work. And now that I brought up weapons, there's one thing that strength affects that's not shown on this page. All weapons have a minimum strength requirement. Knives typically have a strength requirement of 1 to 3, larger melee weapons 4 to 6, pistols have strength requirements ranging from 3 to 5, SMGs, rifles, and shotguns are all in the 4 to 6 range with the heavier weapons doing more damage, heavy weapons, miniguns, rocket launchers, and the like, are in the 6 to 7 range, grenades are 3 to 4, and finally all hand-to-hand -hand weapons, including the Mega Power Fist, are just 1. But, 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 the minimum strength requirement doesn't prevent you from using the weapon. It just applies a 20% penalty to your chance to hit for every point of strength you're short by. Let me take a second to elaborate on this by opening the aim shot screen for this underpowered character and note the 70% chance to hit. In this example, the character has a strength of 4, but the rifle requires a strength of 5. This character has a gain strength perk available to them, and by adding one point of strength, we now have a 90% chance to hit. Now, let's reload this scene for a second. A single point of Strength Thunder, giving you a 20% aiming penalty, can be compensated for by adding extra points into that specific skill, be it small guns, big guns, or what have you. But two points or more under, and your aiming penalty goes from 20% to 40% to 60%, etc, etc, and it becomes a lot more difficult to get your long range up to a usable level. So the greater you need to compensate, the more skill points it's going to cost, and that ends up being a pretty big trade-off, until, of course, you pick up some power armor. Bottom line, a strength of 6 or 7 will be helpful early in mid game, but a strength of 5, 4, or even 1 are perfectly viable as long as you plan around it. Now, perception, as you can see, affects your first aid, doctor, lockpick, and trap skills. Now, I'm not sure why the first three, but trap skills at least make sense. If you want to detect traps, you need to be able to see it first. But since we're not worrying about skills, you can see down here it also affects your sequence. Sequence is one of those simple things that ends up being confusing in Fallout 1 and 2 because of the way it's implemented. All Sequence does is determine what order your turn is in combat, but in Fallout 1 and 2 there is an initial attack and counterattack before Sequence is actually applied. This means that if you start a fight, you get a first strike, then the critter you attack gets a turn, then everybody else on the map gets a turn, determined by Sequence before the first round is over. But once the first round is over, everybody's turn is determined purely by Sequence. Now, if you have a high sequence, this usually means you go first in the second round, but with a low sequence, you'll generally end up last. Using the initial attack and counterattack, if you have a high sequence and you're fighting a single enemy, allowing them to attack first will basically give you two attacks in a row. On the other hand, if you have a low sequence, this advantage will disappear against single enemies, and multiple enemies with higher sequence than you will always attack twice before you get another turn. So if you run into, say, a group of raiders while your character has low perception, every one of those raiders will be able to attack twice after your initial round. This isn't a big deal as long as you have the armor to deal with it, because the initial attack counterattack only happens once per fight, but it can be pretty destructive in your early game before you get any good armor. One thing to note about perception and sequence, Drugs that affect your perception, like Mintat's alcohol or healing powder, also affect your sequence and can be used to change your sequence in the middle of a fight, though it's tough to come up with enough Mintats to make it a consistently viable strategy. Just like strength, your perception does have a direct impact on combat besides what's listed on your character sheet, and in this case it's your accuracy, or your chance to hit. To show this, I've rigged up a little demonstration with everybody's favorite, Melchior the Magnificent! So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to take this specially designed character and turn him into a Kim Addict by feeding him Mintats and Jet until I raise his perception from 1 to 10. And you'll see that every point of perception is worth 8 percentage points to your chance to hit. With a starting perception of 1 and a 91% small gun skill, we have a 0% chance of hitting Melchior the Magnificent at 24 hexes away with a Gauss rifle. Now for each point of perception I add, we go from 0% to 8% to 16%, to 24%, all the way up to 72% at 10 perception. But before you put all your points into perception trying to be an awesome sniper, let's reload the game so I have a perception of 1 again, and this time let's throw all those skill points I've been saving up into the small gun skill. To start off I need to point out this is a tag skill, which means it only increases in increments of 2. But you may notice as I increase the skill, the percentage I increase it by is the same percentage as your accuracy is increased by. So an increase of 8 percentage points in your skill means an increase of 8 percentage points in your accuracy. 
And finally, putting the remainder of my skill points into small guns at 159%, my chance to hit is 68%, only four points below what it would have been with a perception of 10 and my small guns at 91%. The bottom line for perception, if you're building a sniper, you may want to put a couple points in here, but it's not necessary. You can always make up for a low perception with skill points, although you may run into trouble early on with a low sequence, and you should also bear in mind that some really good late game perks require higher than average perception to get. Here we have endurance, and while endurance has almost no effect on your skills, the outdoorsman skill being the only exception, it does have a pretty significant effect on combat, as you would imagine. You won't find your poison or radiation resistance or your healing rate to have a lot of direct effect on combat, unless you're fighting floaters or centaurs toward the end of the game. Even then, as long as you have a little bit of rat away or anti-venom, you should be just fine. But the nitty gritty for this stat comes from your hit points. First off, for every point of endurance you invest, you get two extra hit points for your initial level. But nobody really cares about your initial level. What really matters is how many hit points you get per level as you level up. Now, Fallout 1 and 2's hit point allocation is a little bit harsher than later Fallouts, but not by much. For every even point of endurance you invest, you gain one extra hit point per level. It follows the formula, your endurance divided by 2, rounded down, plus 2. Which means, with endurance of 1, you get 2 hit points per level, and with an endurance of 10, you get 7 hit points per level max. I feel it's important to note here that having an odd number endurance is no better than having the next even number below it. For instance, an Endurance of 4 will get you the same number of extra hit points each level as an Endurance of 5 will. But, if you're planning on taking a Gain Endurance perk later on in the game, a jump from 4 to 5 won't get you anything, but a jump from 5 to 6 will get you one extra hit point per level. That being said, gaining an extra point of Endurance in Fallout 1 and 2, unlike later Fallouts, does not retroactively give you extra hit points for every level you've gained so far. You only gain those extra hit points for those levels you earn afterwards. A more practical way of looking at this is just to ask, how many hit points do you need at the end of a game to beat the final boss? Typically at the end of Fallout 1 you'll be between level 12 and 15 and have somewhere between 90 and 100 hit points, and by the end of Fallout 2 you should be around level 24 with around 150 hit points. This, combined with some power armor, gives you a pretty solid chance to destroying anything you'll run across in the wasteland. One last thing I want to mention about endurance before closing this topic. Fallout 1 and 2 also use endurance as a stat check for critical hits. And by that, I mean when you are hit with a critical hit. Your endurance will be checked to see if any further damage is caused, or to see if any extra effects are applied to your character. And that's pretty much everything I can think of that's important for endurance. A couple of extra points will be helpful, but not entirely necessary, and in both games you can pick up the Lifegiver perk at level 12, which will give you four extra hit points each time you level up. In Fallout 1 and 2, Charisma is largely considered the trash stat. In Fallout 1, Charisma has no effect on combat. In Fallout 2, it's used to determine how many NPCs you can have in your party. Similar to half the stuff we've seen already, the number of NPCs you can keep in your party in Fallout 2 is your Charisma divided by 2 rounded down. So 1 Charisma will get you no NPCs, 2 will get you 1, and 10 will get you 5. Other than that, it has a minor effect on your speech and barter skills, and for everything else, Charisma has an effect on... Fallout 1 does have an initial reaction system for dialogue with NPCs that uses Charisma, but it's impossible to get a negative reaction at all unless you have Negative Karma, or the Child Killer, or Berserker perks. And if you have these perks, then you probably have Negative Karma already, and I think you know why. Fallout 2 does have a Town Reputation system that sometimes checks your Charisma, and both games have a few quest-related Charisma checks that you can use drugs to pass if you really want. Bottom line, if you're playing Fallout 2, add a couple points if you want a larger group, and if you're playing Fallout 1, either ignore it or redistribute those points as you see fit. Intelligence has pretty much no direct impact on combat, but it does directly impact your skill points. Thankfully there's no rounding here, and any investment will pay off at the rate of double your intelligence plus 5 for a range of 7 skill points per level at the low end, up to 25 skill points per level at 10 end, barring any perks or traits you may want to take. There are a few types of skill books to help offset a low intelligence, and in particular they affect 4 of the 5 skills that int contributes to, namely first aid, science, repair, and outdoorsman, but not doctor, but they don't work above 91% and the only combat skill book is for small guns. On top of that, your intelligence also determines the amount and type of dialogue options you get. Anything 3 or below will only get you low intelligence or stupid dialogue, which basically means very few quests and everybody treats you like an idiot. 
Most of the quest dialogue checks lie in the 4 to 6 range, but the best options tend to be in the 7 to 8 range, with 9 and 10 int having only a few dialogue checks between them. To be clear, these are not blanket values. Each of the int checks actually have a number attached to them. There are int 6 checks, there are int 5 checks, there are int 7, 8, and 9 checks, even a single int 10 check in Fallout 1, and 3 more in Fallout 2. But they're all invisible. In fact, all dialogue checks and most statted skill checks in both games are invisible. Not even the empathy perk will help you. Bottom line for intelligence, put some points in here. If you want to actually enjoy the quest lines and make the game just plain easier, set it to at least 7, the most commonly recommended number. But consider a low int character for a future playthrough because some of the dialogues are kind of funny. Well, nummy nummy nana. <laughs> Agility is a pretty important stat for Fallout 1 and 2, and holy jeez, look at all that stuff agility affects. All of your combat skills, small guns, big guns, energy weapons, unarmed, melee, and throwing, and all of your thief skills, sneak, lockpick, steal, and traps. A whole list of skills, armor class, and action points. Can't think of a better way to say this stat is important. And ladies and gentlemen, the most important number on this screen for combat are action points or your AP. Action points determine if you can move, attack, fire a weapon, reload that weapon, open your inventory, use an item, or just plain run away. These two games aren't impossible with low AP, but most good guns cost 5 AP to fire, and pistols and melee weapons start at 3 AP and go up from there. So if you want to attack more than once per round, you need a minimum 6 AP just for melee and pistols, and 10 AP for pretty much everything else. Now there are perks that add action points, and a couple of perks that reduce AP usage, but they require a minimum of 6 agility to get anyway, and no matter what perks you get, having a higher agility gives you more action points throughout the game to begin with. Okay, action points. Well, similar to endurance and charisma, only even agility numbers give you extra action points, so having an odd agility doesn't provide any benefit over the even number below it, unless you decide to get the Brother to Steel Surgery in Fallout 1 or the Gain Agility perk in Fallout 2. Each of which will of course give you an extra point of agility, so if you have an odd agility, it will suddenly become even and you will have an extra action point. The other stat you'll notice changing is your armor class, or AC. Now armor class is kind of a generic term that in Fallout 1 and 2 just adds to your chance to dodge an attack. This stat by itself doesn't reduce damage from a hit at all. It just reduces your chance to get hit in the first place. I'll go more in depth on armor and defense when we get into combat later. For now, just remember the obvious, more AC is good. But to make things even weirder, action points and armor class have a type of synergy where any unused action points left over at the end of a combat round convert to extra armor class that lasts until it's your turn again, as long as you're still in combat. And if you're doing this, then action points help even if you just stand still. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why agility is the most overpowered stat in the game. Bottom line, this is your primary combat stat, max it out, or maybe set it to 9 if you want to take a perk later in the game. At the very least, keep a higher agility if you want an easier game. Meow. When Chris Taylor and I put together special, uh, he didn't put in luck, and I kind of made him put it in later, um, because I really wanted to hook it into everything. I wanted it in critical hits, I wanted it in special encounters, I wanted it in, just hooked up to a lot of low-level systems. Just like Tim Kane says, luck affects a lot of stuff not on the character screen. In fact, here's a list of stuff that I know luck affects. Random encounters, special encounters, how often the mysterious stranger shows up, all bonus criticals perks, critical hit chance, critical failure types, and even how often some of the random encounter maps include a cave full of robbers with massive loot. Mysterious strangers and caves full of loot aside, the focus here is on combat, and that mostly means criticals. Now, you can see from here, your initial critical chance is directly related to your luck, but what this doesn't tell you is what this exactly means. Check this out. We've had a brief look at this screen, and yes, this is what VATS and later Fallouts is based on, yada yada yada, but those pale imitations don't do what this aim shot screen does. First off, you'll notice the chance to hit for the torso is the same as an unnamed shot, and that every other body part is a reduced chance to hit that varies by the level of difficulty up to minus 60% for the eyes. What isn't shown here is that all aim shots add a bonus to your critical chance that's equal to the loss to your hit chance. This basically means you start the game with the ability to add 60% to your crit chance anytime you aim for the eyes, as long as you hit. Okay, so going back to luck, your base critical chance from luck, along with any perks or traits you may have, is added to the bonus from your aim shot. So aiming for the eyes with 1 luck will get you a 61% crit chance, and 10 luck will get you a 70% crit chance. That's not a really big jump, especially when you start adding in perks and traits. Okay, so the most your luck by itself can contribute to your critical chance is 10%, 
and that's if you max it out, and an average luck is still 5%, so what's wrong with going with a 5 luck? Well, your luck also helps with critical failures. Now, critical failures only happen when you miss, so this is a bigger problem early on, and less so when you've improved your combat skill enough to actually have a high hit chance. But your luck isn't used to determine the chance a miss has turned into a critical miss, instead it's used to determine how bad the critical miss is. This part's a little bit complicated, so let me start by painting you a picture. There are five levels of critical failures, the exact effect differs slightly between weapons, but in general, the lowest level failure is just to miss the shot. The next level failure is usually losing a turn, followed by dropping or losing your weapon or ammo, then hitting randomly, unless you're using a flamer, and the most destructive failure on this list, your weapon just blows up in your face. So where does luck come in? Well, with a 5 luck, you have a chance to get any of these failures. But if you drop your luck down to 1, then any critical you have will always be one of the 4 worst options, with a worst option having a lot bigger chance to happen. On the other hand, at 6 luck, you suddenly won't ever have the worst critical happen to you, and at 10 luck, only the best 3 failures will ever happen, and just regular misses have a much bigger chance of happening, as you can see. So all your luck does for critical failures is to move this slider back and forth that determines your chance to get a type of failure. Whew, I hope that made sense. Trying to make this math stuff visually appealing is a pain in the butt. Anyway, bottom line for luck, put a point in here if you want to avoid the worst critical failures, especially if you're taking the Jinx trait, which I'll go into more detail when I discuss traits, or if you just like having more crits or finding unique encounters. But luck's usefulness is limited as soon as you put enough points into your favorite combat skill to max out aimed eye shots, which is usually somewhere around level 5, or pick up a level or two of the more criticals perk. However, if you want any perks that affect your criticals, in particular the Better Criticals perk, which gives you access to instant death criticals you don't normally get, then you'll need at least 6 luck. For those of you who just want to play the game. I wanted to finish up this surprisingly lengthy video with one of the most commonly recommended builds for both Fallout 1 and 2. Note that I took the Gifted trait for those 7 extra special points and tagged the Small Guns, Lockpick, and Speech skills for their usefulness in the game. 7 Intelligence will allow you to access 90% of the dialogue options, getting your speech skill to 100% will allow you to pass any speech checks, and combat should be reasonable once you pick up a pistol or rifle, and downright easy with an SMG or sniper rifle and enough points in your small gun skill. And of course, 9 Agility for all those extra action points. I hope this video helps you and any and all newcomers to these games, especially in light of Bethesda's most recent entry in the Fallout franchise, and I hope that fans of Bethesda's Fallouts will enjoy the rich story and dark humor of the originals and discover why so many people were fans of the originals to begin with. And hey, now that Bethesda's giving away free copies to all you 76 owners, I hope this video helps you in particular. But look, I really like these games, enough to spend several months researching and compiling all the information to make this video. If you liked it and found it useful, please share it, and of course, like and subscribe, and feel free to give me any feedback or ask any questions in the comments. I'm planning on making at least a couple more videos in this series explaining many of the more nuanced facets of these older games, and I hope you'll support me in this endeavor. But even more importantly, I hope this helps all you Fallout players, new and old, just to enjoy what made Fallout popular in the beginning.